from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African and Middle East Division of the Library of Congress. Today's lecture on Muslimanism in Turkey and Beyond, Religion in the Modern World by Neslihan Chavik is sponsored by the Near East Section of the African and Middle East Division. I'm Joan Weeks, head of the Near East Section. On behalf of all my colleagues, and in particular, Dr. Mary Jane Deep, Chief of the Division, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone. Before we start today's program, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the division and its resources in the hopes that you'll come back and use our collections for your research. This division is comprised of three sections that build and serve collections to the researchers from around the world. We cover over 78 countries from more than 35 languages. The African section includes the countries in all of Sub-Sahara Africa. The Hebraic section is responsible for Judaica and Hebraica worldwide. And the Near East section covers all of the Arab countries, including North Africa, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, the Muslims in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans, and the people of the Caucasus. So you can see we're very busy. After the program, we'd like to invite you to fill in the evaluation forms that we've left in your seats and leave them at the information desk at the back of the room. And we are videotaping and recording this presentation, so uh, we invite you to ask questions, but please know that you're providing your permission to be recorded. Now I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Neslihan Javik. She is an associate fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia. Currently, Dr. Javik is leading a project on the de-radicalization and fight against violent extremism at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC. Her work appears in CNN Arabic, Daily Sabah, Orient 21, and Political Theology Today and is translated into Arabic, French, and Turkish. Dr. Jevik helped found the first post-colonial studies research center in Turkey, Palmer, at Üsküdar University, an engaged social entrepreneur. She also leads startup projects from Muslim women's economic and public integration. Please help welcome Dr. Jevik to the podium. Thank you. Um, thank you, John, for this lovely introduction, and thank you, Mary Jane and John, for inviting me here. This is a mesmerizing, very beautiful building, um, So, and thank you, each and every one of you, for coming here today. So I should put my presentation up. Okay, slideshow. Okay, so I'm going to start, I will start by raising a very old question, a question that was actually central to the development of sociology and social theory. So what happens to religion in the modern world? Um, how do religions respond to modernity? And for centuries, the answer ran along a, very, a binary track. So um, in their responses to modernity, religions were expected to either reject it, and that's what we call fundamentalism, to preserve the tradition, or they would secularize the tradition um, and accommodate modernity, and that's what we call liberal religion. And even though this binary track was mostly based on the Christian experience, it's also applied to Islam. Um, but when it's applied to Islam, it's a little bit modified given the uh, perception of Islam as a special religion, which is it, that Islam is un intrinsically anti-modern and intrinsically um, secularization resistant. So given this, the divide then modifies into the idea that Islam gears towards rejection of modernity and Islamic fundamentalism or Islamic rejection of modernity itself is geared towards politically takeover of the state. So accordingly then, if Islam is to engage modernity, it must loosen the orthodoxy more than any other religion uh, while also making a cultural turn. So that also created yet another divide, cultural versus political. Um, 
and this kind of framework, this kind of abstract framework, crystallized into the concept of moderate Islam more recently. And Turkey is picked as the most prominent candidate for it. And the concept has been helpful to some extent in communicating that Islam needs not to reject modernity, but actually can engage it. But there are various problems with the concept moderate Islam. First of all, it reinforces the divides of fundamentalist versus uh, liberal religion, because radic moderation of Islam happens through the pacification of its radical aspects. So meaning that um, the practice of moderate is something less Islamic and more liberal than the norm. So apparently this marginalizes any deeply held religion. Um, any deeply held religion actually must be fundamentalist. Also, another problem with the term is that the conditions for moderate Islam is constantly being, or at least mostly, is being looked out from outside rather than uh, from within. And most interpretations uh, rely on political expediency and political actors in trying to understand how moderation happens. But there's a serious problem with that because party failure is then seen as Islam's failure in engaging modernity. And the Arab Spring was probably the epic example of that. The cultural sentiments that could not translate into political change were then interpreted again, yet again, as Islam's failure into engaging a modern life and institutions. Um, but most importantly, the concept of moderate Islam prevents us from seeing the empirical complexities of religion in Turkey, but also about, more broadly, Islam's engagements of modernity. So in my book, looking at post-80s uh, Islamic transformation, uh, transformation of Islamic identity in Turkey, um, I argued that rather than normatively or generically defining what's going on as moderate Islam, what we're witnessing is the rise of a new religious form, indeed a new religious orthodoxy. And when I say an orthodoxy, I don't mean the separation between orthodoxy and orthopraxic religions. I simply denote a commitment to the super empirical. But this orthodoxy is new because it's neither fundamentalist rejection of modernity nor liberal submission to it. Indeed, within the Turkish context, I call this new form Muslimism. And I um, argue that this new form embraces aspects of modern life while submitting that life to a sacred moral order, generating as such hybrid institutions, discourses, and lifestyles. And we will kind of unpack these as we go. Now, um, why the term Muslimism? Uh, first of all, this new form, looking neither liberal nor fundamentalist, uh, required a new category. Uh, normally, you know, Islamism is used as, as a term, is used as an umbrella term to define any Islamic movement that kind of promotes Islam, whether in public policy or through politics or in everyday life. But even if it's being used as an umbrella term, it's not a neutral term. I mean, it has a very specific epistemological baggage that it brings with it. So, and other scholars too, looking at the world, has recognized that um, since the 1990s and 80s, um, Islamic movements started to look not like the typical um, Islamism. And so they looked for alternative concepts. Moderate Islam was one of them, post-Islamism, Muslimhood, neo-Islamism. But I think what we find in Turkey requires a very clear break from the concept of Islamism. So that's the first reason that I wanted to term this with a new label. Also, I wanted this term to communicate the content of this new form. Now, um, so one key element of this new form that it's hybrid. It doesn't reject nor submit, but it creates hybrid institutions and practices. And the other key element is that it's um, individual orientation. So basically the question Muslims ask is, how do I conduct a pious life while taking part in modernity? And so they're neither state-oriented nor society-oriented. The goal isn't Islamization of the state from top down, or nor it is um, Islamization of the community bottom up to eventually create an Islamic state. And this is not individualism. I found something even more interesting in the field that this was actually filtered through theological concepts, particularly Iman and Tahqiq. We're gonna talk about those uh, in detail later, but it's suffice for now just to quickly define Iman simply means a volunteer and a heartfelt choice, it's religious conviction, and Tahqiq is a, is a conscious choice. Again, I'll unpack these later. So even though Muslimism is not a formal movement and it's not ideological, um, it still is an ism. For one, it capitalizes and promotes a particular reading of Islam and it promotes this reading against Islamism and against um, liberal conceptions and against actually traditional conceptions. 
And although it's not state-centered, it's politically engaged. It gets linked to party politics and it has created a, a very certain political ethos. So before I detail the content of this new form, I want to briefly talk about the conditions and um, open questions. We can unpack these. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. So the, this new form is rooted in the 1980s neoliberalizing policies. Uh, this was the neoliberalization in Turkey was more than an economic shift. It actually created a favorable atmosphere for religious change and for the emergence of alternative religious expressions. Uh, first of all, it undermined statism across spheres of society, so in economy, in culture, in um, social reproduction. Um, and this allowed um, for new economic and political opportunity spaces for Muslim mobilization, and those segments hit hard to, um, until, the new, until the 1980s were marginalized, um, both from uh, economic production and uh, social and political production. And other scholars have recognized this, uh, but what's kind of often overlooked is that neoliberalization also brought with it a new social accounting of modernity. With the secular state, uh, modernity so far until the 1980s were defined along secularist conceptions, whether you're hijabi or not, whether you're religious or not, corporatism, statism. But with the new liberal order, new conceptions started to enter into social accounting of modernity, like individual rights, pluralism, globalization, entrepreneurship. And so these two kind of like low modernity and high modernity started to compete with each other. And that was very important because it seriously taunt down the anti-Islam concept of or uh, rhetoric of modernity that was generated by the Kemalist, the secular state. And it allowed the Muslim populations, the devout populations to reconsider um, aspects of modernity and to reconsider engagements, uh, their engagements with modernity. And all of that also worked to weaken Islamist establishments because um, in Turkey, uh, Islamism has emerged uh, in the mirror image of a secular state um, that defined modernity, that defined national progress, that defined individual progress in the opposite of Islam. So basically it created its sound forbidden modern. Um, but with the neoliberalization, the conditions that generated Islamism got weakened and as a result, Islamism as a discourse started to lose its um, appeal and economic and cultural and political relevance. And the international aspects were also conducive uh, for the rise of Muslimism. They were coupled with the domestic conditions. Let's go through this. So um, neoliberalization also created uh, the agents of Muslimism and it created more specifically any Muslim state group. And this group is composed of people coming from a you know, spheres of society, veiled university students, professionals, technocrats, entrepreneurs, civil activists, and so forth. And they're educated, urbanized, and outwardly mobile, and they use a uni the universal language of rights and globalization and so forth. So they're not marginal to modern life, but they were already integrated into modern life while seeking a higher control over it. And um, this new Muslim state group engaged the modern contemporary life by using Islam, creating what I call the cultural sites of hybridity which is where you know, the Muslimist form emerges. Now the Muslimist, the cultural sites of hybridity first emerged in the markets in the form of business associations that um, engaged the aspect of capitalism while trying to inject moral codes or morally regulate um, capitalism. But it also included some uh, really controversial sites such as Islamic fashion. Although rather than fashion, I prefer to call it personalization of aesthetics of the hijab, but we're going to talk about that later. There also emerged Islamic vacations and hotels. Uh, the picture to my right, probably it's to your left, all the way to the left. Uh, it's a picture from um, the first Islamic hotel that was opened in Turkey back in 1990s. It's the uh, pool for women only. So, but beyond markets, the sites of hybridity also included character education schools that emphasized inner discipline and character over orthopraxy. It included human rights associations who defined rights uh, in reference both to UN Convention and the Medina Certificate, the farewell speech of Prophet Muhammad. It included women's rights organizations who claimed a religious and Islamic identity, but also a democrat identity. And it wasn't only the cultural arena that we saw the sites emerging. Um, the uh, Muslim state group has also articulated any political ethics. Uh, which sees Islamic and modern values uh, not to be incommensurable, but actually complementing towards each other. 
Um, and in particular, again, we're going to talk about this, but the concepts of Iman and Tahqiq within the Muslimist uh, discourse uh, uh, lead uh, the Muslims to define the state uh, within a, a liberal framework, um, and we're going to talk about that more. And in addition to the political ethos, um, the Muslims get linked to party politics to bring about this ethos. So this isn't just a cultural movement. I mean, it engages politics and then it has uh, political consequences. But from markets to the political arena, uh, what we see happening in cultural sites of hybridity is that these are sites of identity production. They resist the hegemony of the secular state on defining modernity and how to be modern. And they uh, resist the hegemony of Islamism on defining true religion and who is a good Muslim. More broadly, they define modernity to be guilt-free, so modernity is no longer reduced to a sum of evil effects destroying the Muslim conscience and Islamic sensibilities. For example, you can have a pluralistic public sphere, but you can still have faithful individuals. Um, and they also redefine Islam to be unapologetic, not redefined, but revitalize faith to be unapologetic. One can be faithful and still promote a pluralistic public sphere or dress like Grace Kelly, as long as you know she is um, within the boundaries of the orthodoxy. So here is some info on my field research. I'm kind of going to you know, pass this. If there are questions, we can go back. But basically, I interviewed the leaders of, um, I picked up you know, political uh, uh, arena, human rights organizations, business organizations, and women's rights uh, organizations. And I interviewed and did en ethnographic observations with the leaders from the congressmen and women to um, uh, sector chairs of the business associations to leaders of human rights activism, activists. So to precisely understand what the Muslimist discourse is, I um, use the infamous treaties, which is Din, Devla, Dunya, uh, religion, world, and state. Um, and I further looked at reality orientations in each realm, ontology, agency, and action, for example, um, how do I weave religion? What does religion mean to me? What does the good state mean to me? And who am I assigning agency to establish that view and to maintain it? And what kind of action I think is appropriate uh, for us to maintain that kind of meta view? So I um, compared Islamist and Muslimist elements with each other to basically communicate uh, the newness and the innovation of Muslimist form, but I'm not redefining Islamism. It's basically coming from uh, the, the work that was previously done on it. So normally what I do in my talks is I go through different cells, but today, given today's importance as Women's Day, uh, I wanted to do something different. Uh, first of all, um, I will introduce data about um, how Muslims formulate the self and the community, the Muslim Ummah, and I want to uh, talk about or focus on the particular role played by women uh, in, the, in formulation of uh, the conceptions of self and community. And I'm going to use fashion as a site of hybridity to um, kind of demonstrate how these transformations happen. Now, there are a lot of stigmas about Islam out there, and one of them is that Islamic theology is marked by authoritarian communal attitudes. It's a communitarian authoritarian religion that violates uh, the individual and uh, her or his self-expression. Now, indeed, this isn't necessarily interesting to Islam, but um, to, but this is something that's formulated by uh, Islamist movements and Islamist uh, intellectual thought. And in fact, within itself, it's quite coherent and quite rational. Now, Islamists are focused on preserving the Christian religion, however they define it. And to preserve Christian religion, they define an authoritarian community. Basically, the community has authoritative power over the individuals. And that is so that the community can keep individuals within correct moral action and prison codes, because without that control, individuals um, may breach moral boundaries. So individual and the self-expression is seen as threats to the shared purity of Islam and social cohesion. And in order to um, keep individuals within, moral, within the correct moral action, Islamists also focus on orthopraxy, meaning the uh, ritualistic aspects of religion. Uh, especially the ones by which one can be recognized as a Muslim. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is the hijab. And so for Islamists, um, the Islamists try to prescribe um, how the hijab should be worn. So it's not only that you have to wear the hijab, but also uh, the ways you're supposed to wear the hijab. And those prescriptions tend to be determined by men. Uh, so that also means at the uh, local level, whether it's a community or family, uh, man policies and limits women's moral agency. 
So when we look at Muslimism, we see a radically different formulation of the self and community. We see that these traditional conceptions are being transformed, and the direction of this transformation is towards the sharpening of the individual and the undermining of authoritarian communal religious codes. And fashion, I know when I say fashion, it constantly you know, brings those images about Vogue and about consumerism and about markets as if it's a very thin place, but bear with me, it's gonna, um, it's gonna surprise you. So hijab and fashion is a, a very proper angle to kind of trace how those changes are happening. Um, so when I was talking to women in the field uh, about various things from liberal state and theology to fashion, uh, overwhelmingly they were talking, they were really reactionary against Islamist and traditional conceptions. Uh, most of them said, looking back at their college years, so these women were in their maybe late 30s, early 40s, and looking back to their college years, they were saying, back in the 80s and 90s, we were not able to cover an expression of who we were because the colors, you know, dark brown, black, dark black, or dark green, dark green. And in terms of styles, too, it was very monotype. So they weren't able to cover an expression of who they were. So it wasn't about oh yeah, we couldn't be trendy, we wanted to look more fashionable. It wasn't about that, it was about expressing who they were. And so um, they would criticize both the traditional establishments and the Islamists for trying to format the veil. In fact, they had a name for this era of 80s and early 90s, they called it the uniform era where the hijab was seen as a uniform. But they were saying, but look, women are not uniform, we're different from each other. How are we different from each other? Well, some of us are 15, some of, some of us are 50, some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us um, have outgoing personalities, some of us like black, some of us don't. Um, some of us are married, some of us are single, so, and we have different tastes and we have different personalities. And so they wanted to cover an expression of all of those unique individual features. So for example, this um, uh, female from Capital Women's Platform said, initially the tessetter attire, tessetter means Islamic covering or Islamic clothing, was a uniform and now we sort of got out of the uniform era. But in Turkey, the veiling styles are still monotyped. Plus there is the age factor. Why would a 60 year old woman and a 15 year old girl wear the same things, tie their scarves similarly or use same colors? Another woman was saying, how many veiled women we have is how many types of veil we have. I believe that veiling style is just like dressing style. Some women believe that veiled people represent each other and Muslims with colorful outfits mispresent other veiled women. This totalization comes both from inside and outside. They try to stigmatize us and confine us within a political discourse. So, but why is it important that these women want to cover an expression of who they are. I mean, what does that tell us? Well, it portends those changes that I was talking about. First, the self has found a new legitimacy and interests among the Muslimists, and that challenges the Islamist homogeneity, the idea of the community being authoritarian and self being illegitimate and self being a threat. Second, self styles replace uh, prescriptions, and again, those prescriptions are uh, mostly defined by men. So by self-styling or personalizing their hijab, the colors or whatever the styles, they're actually exercising moral agency on their body because it's, you know, it's how you dress and then now you have moral agency in defining what's appropriate. So what's the moral boundaries that I have to abide by as I, you know, cover myself? And what's also the limits about me expressing myself? So that challenge uh, patriarchal codes. Now, from, for many, uh, this will be seen as, you know, the explanation for this, or how, how did this happen, it probably will um, follow a very stereotypical wave. Okay, this is market expansion, it's individualism via consumerism. But what I found, and that was even more interesting, was that uh, this process was neither uh, related to individualism nor it was freed from God. Now, we're gonna delve a little bit into theology and you will see why I think fashion is a fascinating um, uh, phenomena or aspect of, of uh, our lives. So um, this legitimacy of the self was indeed filtered through the grammar of faith and core theological concepts, iman and tahqiq particularly. So linguistically, iman means being sure of something, certainty, being in a state of security. In the Quranic usage, it means unshakable convic conviction, binding one's heart to Allah, and it's a heartfelt submission. So it's this voluntary, heartfelt submission or love of God. And the locus of Iman, then, is the heart. And this wasn't only the Muslimist discourse. I mean, it's not an innovation by Muslimists. Um, 
theologians, early theologians and scholars coming from different theological streams, which at time conflicted with each other, such as Maturidi, Taftanzani, Ibn Hazm al-Ghazali, all of those scholars also saw Iman's location to be the heart. Uh, now, this is important. Uh, the uh, focus on Iman is very important. Think about it this way. If I was an Islamist, if I had a gun with me, and then if I raised the gun and I told all the women in the audience, you got to cover your hair right now. Or from the reverse, I may be a secularist, a, a laicist, extremely annoyed by the veil, and I may take a gun and say, all of you take your hijabs off right now. And I could have even required you for my public policy to not to come to school, to not to work because you're wearing a hijab. But as a state or as any authority, I cannot enact a law asking all of the citizens to love God by heart. Or I cannot enact a law uh, telling the citizens from now on you stop loving God because heart cannot be controlled by external sources of authority. And that's where the legitimacy of the self within the Muslim discourse comes. It's rooted in the theological uh, retrieval of the concept of Iman. Now, there is more. Uh, when religion is a uh, voluntary choice, it also becomes a conscious choice. And overwhelmingly, both men and women in my interviews, as they define true piety and said that it's true piety is Iman, they were also talking about tahqiq. And uh, tahqiq basically means investigation. Um, so basically, one needs to ask, what is it that I believe and why? So religion isn't something, or mature faith isn't something that just happens to you by virtue of, uh, you know, borning in, uh, in a community, in a religious community, doesn't make your faith mature. Instead, you have to deliberate, infer, rather than blindly submitting to inherited knowledge. And tahqiq is a means-centered concept as much as ends-directed. It's about what tahqiq questions, but it's also about the fact of tahqiq itself. Now, all of that within the Muslimist uh, discourse then uh, presents us with a self with potent agency, and that absolutely goes against Islamism. And if you think about ISIS today, I mean, it makes so much sense. Um, so moral action should flow within the Muslimist um, uh, discourse from the heartfelt and con conscious submission and choice. Um, so moral agency and autonomy, it gives the self moral agency and autonomy vis-a-vis uh, -vis external authority. And this is not rejection of communal experience. So it's not individualization. It's not rejection of communal experience, but it's simply individuation. So marking one's difference, uh, self-actualization, and expression, self-expression in rejection of oppressive communities that see the self as a threat. So Muslims then transform uh, the Muslim ummah <coughs> or the idea of community conservatively into a type of sodality where they're still strongly committed to a moral community, a common good, and a shared identity, but they, at the same time, um, require that community to acknowledge the self, to acknowledge the unique traits of the self, and um, the individual choice, preference, and, and difference. So another woman, in relation to what I've just argued, was saying, talking about the jamaats, you know, the, uh, the informal uh, religious networks, uh, that were commensurate with an authoritarian style of community. Throughout the 1980s, the religious scene was dominated by the Jamaats and Tariqats. People couldn't even take one step independent of the Jamaat. They would follow whatever the head of the Jamaat says. By then, also, if you were religious or veiled, people would expect you to have or accept certain rules and ideas. By the 1990s, she continues, this changed, and people became more individualized in terms of being able to act and decide independently. This is how I view the CVPA platform. So this woman quits the Jamaats and then joins this uh, women's uh, association. And then she says, here women are not tied to anywhere. This is why I decided to become a member. Women here are women who were able to realize this individualization. They have different and creative ideas. They can express these differences. Before, you couldn't even think about that. So going back to self-styling and fashion, so the importance of covering in expression of who one is, and, and that's basically based on um, or filtered through this you know, broader movement where within theology, akil and tahqiq, meaning reason and investigation and iman, um, uh, start to compete with traditional knowledge and conformity to community. So that also gives us cues about how the Muslimists weave the self. Now, let me make a parenthesis. For the Islamists, um, both for Muslimists and Islamists, uh, the self is something tricky because you know, the self is always vulnerable to the seductions of the shaitan, of, of, uh, dev, of uh, devil. 
Uh, for Islamists, however, this, uh, the self is so weak that it requires an external authority to keep him uh, within you know, correct moral actions, whether that be the state or the community. So in order to create a religiously defined society and faithful individuals, there needs to be an external authority. Um, and sin, according to Islamists, is not necessarily a personal choice. It's the seduction of the devil, seduction of the shaitan. Now for Muslims, this is a little different. Uh, for Muslims, remember the you know, concentration on Iman, um, you are responsible as an individual to choose between permissible and impermissible deeds. And indeed, that's how you're gonna be judged. The self is still vulnerable to shaitan, but it's self's uh, nefis uh, fight, it's personal jihad to fight against the shaitan and then to keep itself away from the permissible, the impermissible. And you gotta do that whether there's a state that's telling you that or not. Um, so, and another aspect of this is that for the Muslimist, the Islamic self is someone who's, who is a critical thinker, intellectually curious, and she's creative. It, it questions established codes and receives knowledge and, a cons and the conservative hierarchy. And she or he is not simply a dull image of community, but has its own differences, unique assets and traits, and hij the you know, self-styling of hijab is just one practical example of that. Um, there's a long <laughs> quote, um, I'm not gonna read all of it, but basically uh, this quote speaks into what I just described. Um, a human rights activist, a female says, when I was confronted for the first time with the ban on veil in college, so she was wearing a hijab in, in Turkey, there was a ban on hijab, you couldn't go to university. I realized that traditional religiosity didn't mean anything. I had a faith that come from tradition by then. <clears throat> then I stopped all of my readings and started reading um, Quran. What do I believe in and why? Is the veil really an order of Allah or is it nonsense? Allah has given us aql, reason and intellect, and the skills and capacity for reasoning. Um, it says in the Quran, are you not thinking, are you not using your aql? So as you can see, this kind of speaks into the ideal uh, conception of the self within Muslimist community, it being you know, someone who questions, someone who goes back to the original resources and think for herself, kind of like try to dig out the truth. Now, fashion isn't the only, um, area where we find this changing conception of self and community. Another area we find it is religious learning and uh, sources of religious authority. What we find in Turkey is that increasingly there's a shift um, uh, from you know, the charismatic, the parashial elite to the alim. Uh, the alim is basically the religious scholar. So uh, people are uh, increasingly turning towards the alim for their religious learning. And because we, this is something we find um, very clearly among the Muslimists and they <clears throat> think of Alim as, they kind of uh, cherish Alim because they say that he establishes his vocational relationship through formal education, through studious work, and he's an intellectual, he's an autonomous thinker, he's almost comparable to a scientist. And as you can see, this kind of embodies the uh, most ideal version of the Muslimist self. And importantly, Alim is not someone to be followed blindly. So when you're reading a book or when you're discussing with a scholar, you're not expected to blindly submit to this person as opposed to a, uh, you know, a head of a Gemma. Uh, you still have the critical distance between yourself and the author as, or the guide and the mentor, and then you still have to like, decide for your own and then dig the truth uh, for yourself. Uh, and uh, this human rights uh, female activist speaks into that and she says, not everybody can be a doctor or a sociologist. Uh, we must have alims we trust and we learn from. However, this must not be in the form of being tied to one person or following a gemma. You read the books and works of these alim and you evaluate these through your akal, your reason and your evaluation. Um, another area we see the rising of the shelf and the, under, the self and the undermining of the community is traditional family. Uh, and this is kind of where it gets tricky because the quest for the self and self's autonomy um, uh, goes both for men and women. Uh, but when it comes to family, I figured, I found that there were some gendered lines. Uh, basically, uh, within the family, women had to pick an additional battle in their quest for self-autonomy. Uh, I mean, this is you know kind of very typical, not just Islam and Turkey. We we have it, you know, maybe every part of the world. So basically, women were talking about um, how the definition of womanhood around motherhood and wifehood is a problem because this um, doesn't allow them to discover who they really are. Again, in parentheses, is the legitimacy of the self. It's legitimate to be interested in the self to discover who you are. I mean, within the Islamist uh, perception of community, this isn't even relevant. 
Um, and so basically those patriarchal codes and relations worked as barriers um, in the eyes of the woman to develop their self-identity. And I asked them a question. I was like, so um, do you, would you mind your daughter to live, um, you know, before she gets married, to live by herself for some time? And women, maybe like one or two, um, except one or two women, uh, like 30 women said, absolutely. And the reason why they said that, because they were like, okay, so the father's house and the husband's house are places where, you know, women cannot really develop um, their self-identity and develop life strategies and, you know, get to know themselves and establish their independency. So that doesn't mean that they're like feminists. I mean, they're uh, still, uh, you know, promote this idea of, you know, marriage and, and that's still a very important institution. They're not against all these, I mean, they're, you know, religious people. But they th maybe, I mean, it's interesting, maybe this is um, living by themselves before going into the husband's house. I mean, maybe that's just a temporary place for them to kind of like strengthen themselves and then go into the marriage. For men, the answer was also yes, but men was more practical. They were saying, well, you know, if uh, she won a good university and that you know, the college was out of town, then she can go. So it was more like practical, based on practical reasoning, rather than this discourse about yeah, discovering herself, developing life strategies, and so forth. So this also shows us that women's role in creating and disseminating and shaping the future of Muslimism is quite important because they kind of catch on on this, you know, uh, gendered issues and they're uh, very progressive from that perspective. So going back to uh, fashion a little bit before we, um, you know, pack things up. Um, so fashion also works, so it's one area to look at, you know, one aspect of it, we can look at the changes that's going through in terms of conceptions of self and community. But there's also another aspect um, that brings into this, you know, hybridity back to our attention. Uh, so this is a picture of the Hashama swimsuit. Um, the Hashama swimsuit emerged back in the 1990s. Basically, you can swim in this. I actually wore it, took pictures with it. Um, and I met the first producer of the Hashimas, and uh, he's called, I mean, there's an epithet to define him. He's called the man who made Muslim women swim. Now, swimming may, <laughs> may sound like a very thin exercise, natural, has nothing to do with politics, but not really. I mean, in Turkey, swimming is associated, the public beaches are associated with this, you know, secular, Kemalist um, identity. Um, if, if, even if you look at the world, when we say swimming, you know, we constantly think about bikinis um, and uncovering. So it's like you can't swim if you're not uncovered. But this guy basically rejected those divides and said, you, you can swim if you're a Muslim. Here, wear my Hashema. And um, it may not look nice and it may um, offend the secular conscience because the normality of swimming is uncovering. Although I would like to remind you the uh, song uh, about the polka dots, itsy bitsy teeny weeny. I mean, <laughs> you know, you know that emerged when bikini was first introduced to the American audience after France and one of the magazines by then defined that no decent girl would wear this. But later on, a few years later, you know, along with the feminist movement's, uh, you know, emergence, it became the only way, you know, to swim. So what sites of hybridity and fashion, you know, in this particular example does is that it kind of throws back at your face the normality standards we so abide by. I mean, you don't have to wear a bikini to swim. And we have many more examples of this emerging. Like, um, so I own a uh, hijabi conservative company, and then throughout the company work, I've met a lot of interesting people. For example, this girl, she is going, she's uh, one of the first Olympic lifters, um, and she's a hijabi girl, and she was having a lot of difficulty finding clothing because when you lift, you have to like put it on your leg, and when you take it up, it raises whatever you're wearing. So they were wearing like really tight suits, and that was just not appropriate for her. So she was like, "Well, I'm going to go to Olympics, but what am I going to wear?" So that's the other thing. Like we look at um, the Muslim world, and we say, "Yeah, we need more education. You know, these women need to know about their rights." But honestly, even if they want to go to do you know Olympics, they don't have clothing for it. They want to play basketball. What am I going to wear? You know, that's. A quite important question. So basically, by creating the Hashama, what this guy has done was to create new public agencies and new possibilities for Muslims to engage modernity. So apparently, they're not fundamentalists because they're because for an Islamist, you know, they would say, "What are you talking about? What's swimming? You know, there's jihad. People are dying." Um, even actually, there was an author who wrote about the Caprice Hotel, and he said, "Can you see people who die in Chechenistan from the beautiful uh, windows of the Caprice Hotel?" 
So you're going to, of course, have these tensions, but um, that doesn't mean that Muslims aren't aware of that or they, they aren't actively engaged in that debate. They are actively engaged in the public debate. They are actively politically engaged. They get linked to political parties, but that's also their uh, also living life. Um, so, and one last thing, this also kind of pushes back the secular and Islamist totalization of uh, Muslim women. Uh, especially hijabi women, expected to dress the same way, to vote the same way, to love the same way, to live the life the same way. So it kind of brings out the um, diversity of, uh, of women and speaks back into what I was just discussing earlier about the legitimacy of the self and the changing conceptions about community. Now, this is also an issue of identity. This is, um, first of all, Muslimism is not unique to Turkey. Um, and I will come to that slide unpack that a little bit more, but for now, uh, I think uh, in the US we find a very similar process. Uh, the Muslim mipster movement, basically hipster coming together with Muslim and then you have the mipster. Uh, so, <laughs> so the mipster is considered as the third place. It's where you know the house and, and the host is blended towards each other. And I think the third place really resembles what I called in Turkey the cultural sites of hybridity. You know, it's where you don't reject modernity, you don't submit to it, but you kind of like create this hybridity. And hipster is someone obviously non-confirmist, politically liberal, and it cherishes the authenticity of the self. I mean, that's the main element. And if you look at hijab, you know, the global stigmas about it is that it's conformity to a patriarchal community. It kills the self. It colonizes the self through the community. So how does a hipster and a hijab come together and then this could be a mipster, fashion and mipster culture? Well, that's, that puzzle is what the mipster capitalizes because they now introduced um, the mipster in the US, they reintroduced themselves as passionately religious actors, passionately, uh, passionately Muslim people, but at the very same time already and rightfully modern and American. They cherish self-authenticity and naturalness, uh, that also within religious submission, and that also speaks into my previous um, discussion on the self becoming legitimate, the individual becoming legitimate. and. Um, it, it, the mipster challenges the monotone divides of modernity versus religion, Islam versus mess, uh, West or Muslim versus American. So, um, just we're gonna, I'm gonna pack it up. Um, so, why is it important to understand? Um, well, take a, let, let me take a step back. So. When we say Islam or any religion, obviously religions are orthodoxal and they have an objective truth uh, for the faithful. And it's not like as the world changes and the essence of religion changes, that's not the case. But different actors articulate different expressions of religion. I mean, you have Islamism, you have Muslimism, you have liberal theology. I mean, it's kind of like a range. Um, and in the post-80s Turkey, conditions were such that this new form of Muslimism has emerged. And this new form, importantly, um, challenged the divides of modernity versus religion and political versus cultural. And again, as a reminder um, about the political versus cultural, the Muslimists are not oriented to the state. They're not after establishing an Islamic state, but they have produced any political ethos. So the Iman and Tahqiq, while they um, uh, push for a community that recognizes individual agency, they also push for a state model that's framed on the basis of individual rights. The example I gave about enacting you know, a law that would control the heart, you can't. And Iman is something that's located in the heart. So for Muslims, the tension between moral freedoms and a secular state should be resolved through a liberal state that kind of recognizes those, those individual rights. And again, they get linked to party politics and, and they're politically engaged. <clears throat> Now, why is it important to recognize this in the form? I mean, what good does it do for us? Obviously, there is intellectual curiosity, but that's not just that. Um, Muslimism in, in Turkey is probably the most um, prominent or uh, eligible actor to promote a democratic secularism that can balance tensions between moral freedoms and the secular state. I mean, the secular state historically uh, had a tendency to violate the rights of the uh, moral rights and moral freedoms, but on the other hand, you know, you don't want religion to co-opt, uh, you know, the state either. And in fact, uh, both uh, enforcement of religion and prevention of religious rights is something that Muslims are equally uh, burdened and, and offended with. Also, um, Muslims are 
you know, it, it's the religious expression can promote um, a more progressive uh, gender relation. And maybe most importantly, the rise of Muslimism in Turkey is, if, is an alive example of um, uh, a counter narrative, a living counter narrative, counter alternative, and a counter narrative to radical religion. And it's coming from within. It's not coming from you know, political strategies, political expediency, or market expansion. I mean, it's theologically rooted. So it's, a very, po it's, it's very powerful. Um, and Muslimist impulses do not, uh, Muslimism is not only unique to Turkey. I, I ca call it Muslimism in the context of Turkey. But we find impulses of it uh, in the region. Um, even if, for now, they're politically co-opted and haven't been able to translate into political change, those cultural sentiments exist, they continue, and they in large part explain the Arab attraction to Turkey. I don't think it was simply because you know, they liked the uh, prime minister by then, who is now the president, but it was you know, the ability of Turkey to live this um, hybrid life where you, know, you, are, you have your Muslim identity, you don't have to sacrifice from it, but you can still you know, swim or engage the liberal state or you know, uh, engage public debate. Um, so what of the future of Muslimism? Of course, it's historically contingent. I mean, when we say religion as culture, that also means, look, you know, different conditions are going to result in, I mean, it's a very simple formula in different religious expressions. Um, and it's possible that any t at any point it may turn into Islamism or become liberal religion. It's quite um, vulnerable, actually, to turn into liberal religion, but maybe through questions we'll talk about that. So domestically, party politics will be effective. Turn to an authoritarian state or an Islamist state will bode ill for the Muslimist form. Kurds, economy, and middle class, like how, are, how is Turkey going to handle uh, uh, from now on the peace process with the Kurds? Economy and middle class and external conditions, security threats, um, Syrian immigration, Islamophobia, relations with the West. Because when you look back at the 80s, the international context were very conducive for this type of religious expression to emerge, but it seems right now that it's the international context is actually promoting the otherwise. Um, so one last thing, again, I said that Muslimism was not only unique to Turkey. In fact, it's not only unique to Islam, um, which is the, co the concept of new religious orthodoxies actually is more global. It's a potential general type of engagement. In particular, it may be helpful to categorize uh, US evangelicals after the 1980s. Christian Smith, uh, for example, a very prominent um, scholar on evangelicalism. What differentiates evangelicals is their ability, unlike liberal and fundamentalist movements, to maintain both difference from an engagement with American society. This is actually what we have discussed Muslimism you know, doing. Like It doesn't reject modernity. It doesn't submit to it, but it creates its own vernacular uh, model, maybe. So I want to finish with this picture. So uh, the girl on, the, on my left, I think it's to your right, the one who's taking the photograph, um, I met her very recently, again, through the company work, and she is the only war journalist that is uh, a hijabi, and she's a Turkish female. And uh, she took this picture in Syria when she was um, very recently going through the you know, ISIS uh, regions and so. And so she's wearing a hijab, as you can see, and, and we don't even have many word, like female war journalists. And this girl is a devout Muslim. She's wearing the hijab, and she's a war journalist. And she's, a take, she's taking a picture of this other female. I'd like you to look at her shoes. Um, and also, I mean, this picture to me was very moving because you have, you know, very clearly you can see that hijab doesn't have to mean one thing. Right? I mean, in one case, you have a war journalist, I mean, more progressive than most secular women that I know, right? Who goes to a war. He has a, by the way, she is married and she has a kid, like her kid is like four years old and she's going to Iraq next month. And uh, you see this other woman, also hijabi, uh, but I mean, it, I know from the story that this other girl doesn't want to cover her face, but she has to because that's, you know, the external authority wants her to do that. So I think I'm done here. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much, Neslahan, for illuminating this very fascinating uh, sites of hybridity in Turkey and beyond. I think we have a few minutes for questions. And again, I'd just like to state that um, if you can limit your questions to just a few um, 
thoughts on the program itself and also know that uh, since we're videotaping this, you're giving your permission to be recorded. So um, we'll entertain a few questions. Eve, I see your hand. Um, I mean, it's, I'm not, it's not a matter of maybe exception. It's a matter of them practicing, I suppose, what they think they should be doing. In Turkey, I can tell you this, though. In Turkey, uh, we don't have the abaya. Like, the abaya has never, I mean, we have people who are wearing the peche, you know, like the face thing and the, you know, black. But they're mostly, um, uh, they mostly belong to a certain gemma or a certain tarika. In Turkey, since... The 70s, since the 60s, the uh, Islamic textile industry has been a bit more diversified than what we find in Gulf region. Um, and Turks don't cover their face, most of them don't. Um, in terms of the West, I mean, you have a lot of different immigrants, right? So uh, it may be a family that uh, is more adherent, like that has a more traditional conception of what the hijab is and who the self is and how the community should work. And, I should mention I was having a conversation with one of the uh, uh, previous uh, congressmen of the Welfare Party, which is more associated with, you know, I suppose they had more of an Islamist discourse than Muslimist. And then for him, the hijab was something that defined the limits of the community. Um, so it wasn't, and, and that's, this is really problematic because you wear hijab because, you know, you think that it's God's, um, you know, uh, requirement of you that you think it's fires. But for the man, it also had an ideological purpose. It had the purpose of separating us versus them, Muslims from others. So maybe that family comes from that type of theological reading, whereas the other one comes from a different theological reading. So that's, that's the main thing, though. Like, you know, religion uh, is articulated differently by different agents. That doesn't mean that there is variety of Islams. I mean, there is one Islam, and Muslims are orthodoxial. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hope that, that helped. Yeah, Mike? Thank you very much for your talk. Could you give us the names of some leaders and some publications? How does one follow these, uh, these mm. trends? Who's writing on them? Are they have newspapers, Right, so, the, okay, one thing, Muslimists are not a formal movement. They don't have, you know, bulletins or newsletters and so forth, but it's uh, more of a cultural movement, and when they're... Uh, they meet with each other, they recognize on those movements. But the sites that I studied, for example, included Capital Women's Platform, uh, Muslim Dash, uh, a human rights organization, Musiat, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest um, economic, Muslim economic businessman associations in Turkey, and the, um, the um, uh, Justice and Development Party. But that was when I interviewed them, that was in their second term, and things kind of have changed since uh, 2010. So, yeah. I can write down those names for you after. Yeah. So we have some more questions? Well, I just had one as I was thinking through it. Um, I know in Turkey for so many times um, there was kind of, um, if you asked somebody, can you go ahead and do this or commit to this, there was always kind of the inshallah. Meaning God willing, uh, yeah, yeah. and I hope for it, you know, kind of um, self um, predetermined whether you would be able to do it or not. And how would you think of free will, this emerging kind of concept of critical thinking about how you're going to do things, would work out? I mean, that's uh, uh, one of the central questions that had Islamic theologians fight with each other and even you know, uh, accused of each other for being kafir and try to do tekfir, meaning, you know, taking someone out of uh, religion. It's a, it's a tricky question, but, um, so the thing is, but what I mean when I say agency, uh, it's not the agency, it's not, you know, opposed to this idea of predestination. Plus, even 
when there is predestination, you still have a choice. I mean, in hadith, for example, so our prophet uh, is doing salah, and he has an abaya on him, and this poor man is standing there, like, you know, really poor, whatever, and then he looks at the prophet, and he thinks within himself, uh, oh, I should steal that, because now he's going to do salah, he can't move, so I should steal it. Meanwhile, the prophet is thinking, um, I should give my abaya to this poor man. So, I think, I mean, I'm not a theologian. I mean, I, you know, read theology, but I'm not a theologian. So the idea there is, so the predestination here is that the guy is going to get the abaya. Whether he can get it through stealing it or through, uh, you know, prophet's blessing, that's his agency. Now, when it comes to another example that I've encountered throughout my, you know, research, I <laughs> was talking to this guy who owns, uh, he was the sector uh, chair of automobile industry at Musiad. And then he was telling me this, you know, one time this Jama had the Imam comes and then he wants to buy a car and I tell him, look, you're buying the car, buy insurance. He was like, no, haram insurance, you know, you know, I can't, like it's pretty, you know, the faith, I can't buy insurance. Then he makes an accident and then he comes back and say, okay, well, can you give me insurance now? So, I mean, the, <laughs> the thing is, like, all those concepts are being so misunderstood, too. Like, the, the whole Quran, like, you have to have, as an individual, you're responsible to choose between good and bad. And that doesn't mean that um, you don't, like, you have agency there. You have to have agency. So, also, it's important to differentiate the agency I'm talking about isn't towards God himself. I mean, it's not freed from God. It's the agency towards um, the head of a jama'ah or towards a, 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 a state, whether Islamist or a secular state, um, I think. Anybody else? Question? Okay. Um, Mohanad. Yeah, no, that's very true. And so when I was doing my, this, what you're suggest, like what you're saying in terms of like, you know, this has becoming uh, recently, the fa I mean, this is a very recent development. Back in when I was doing this research, uh, this was not the case. I mean, today, Dolce & Gabbana and Tommy Hilfiger, um, Mango, uh, all of them, Donna Kron, did I say that? All of them has invested in the Islamic markets. Why? Because the markets are calculated to be $469 billion in 2020. So there's a lot of money to be made. Um, and so, but this is actually precisely the moment where we should talk about how the emergence of hijabi fashion is, has been filtered through theological concepts because now everybody looks at it, oh, there, it's consumerism. It's just, you know, Muslims are being engulfed by capitalist markets. So markets are finally converting Islam into vanity, into consumerism and uh, secularizing the orthodoxy. But what, what I found with the uh, early adopters, let's just say, uh, because those women were in their 40s and they were um, the first ones in Turkey by then kind of like to adopt this kind of like discourse about fashion and personalization of the aesthetics of hijab. And theirs was not simply about looking more trendy. It was about being able to. Oh yeah, I mean another thing like you, the one who covers in Saudi Arabia wears a bikini in Miami. So I mean it's about you're right. Many reasons for women, some of them do hijab because in their community it's easier to find a husband that way, or a job. But that's not about. I mean this question is kind of like um, it brings back the state and community and organizations and the society back into our plate, right? So. Um, if you're not allowed to not hijab in a country, you're going to wear it, whether you want it or whether you don't. But that doesn't take out of um, the authenticity of hijab or itself or why are people now, or the legitimacy of the question and the interest of the question of 
what does the hijabi fashion mean? You know what I mean? So that's different. Um, but yeah, I mean, people, people do that. Some uh, do hijab because they think that that's farz and then they're more, um, you know, knowledgeable on it and they see it as, as a farz and part of the orthodoxy and some does it for traditional reasons. I think we want to thank Neslahan again for a <laughs> wonderful presentation, especially celebrating Women's History Month at the Library of Congress, illuminating a lot of new concepts of how women are uh, modernizing in Muslimism. Thank you very much, Neslahan. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.